So uh, if you haven't filled out the surveys yet, they were due midnight last night, but don't panic. Just go ahead and fill them in anyway. Uh, I think 5% off of a 2% thing is so negligible that I, I won't even sort of ding you for late penalties yet. Uh, fill them out. You've missed your opportunity, however, to uh, fill them out before seeing the results. We're going to go through the results right now. Uh, I think it's just fascinating. So I posted the results of the Rokich value survey on the Blackboard. I won't go through all of those just because there's like 36 charts in the results, and that's just a lot of class time. Look at them. I think they're fascinating to look at. And the most interesting part of it for me was the wide individual variation. So the things that you thought were important to achieve in your life and the things that you thought were important to sort of be as a person varied really widely, uh, dramatically in some cases, where people rated individual values as very high or very low. And sometimes there was a big, big spread. So check those out. I think it'll be interesting in the context of have, knowing what your own answers were. Uh, I could say just in, in quick summary, uh, you were all sort of very keen on things like love and happiness and wisdom, uh, less keen on things like obedience or cleanliness. Uh, so I don't know, those seem reasonable to me. Uh, but the point for us is just the, to have you reflect a little bit on what your values are and to take a, a good hard look at the, this list of values, which were all more or less extra scientific values. So these are things that you have uh, big differences in how important that you think they are, but you're nonetheless, many of you are going to try to participate in the scientific project where you have some small set of core values that you're all trying to navigate uh, together. So uh, take a look at that. That's interesting. Uh, we'll go through, let's, I'm going to very briefly go through the results of the uh, initial survey, what I call the initial survey on Blackboard, because they're sort of more relevant for, for this class specifically. Uh, this is fascinating to me. So we've got less than 15% of you from arts and humanities. So hi, arts and humanities people. Welcome. You are in a tiny minority here. Uh, I think you have an advantage in this class because you will have written a bunch of essays before, uh, but you're, you're less than 15% less than of you. And you can say almost all of you are in some kind of science or other. Uh, and sciences plus engineering lands you at about 80% of this class is in some kind of STEM field. Uh, so I'm, I'm really glad to see that. Uh, I love being able to talk to science students. Uh, you guys are the future of the cutting edge of knowledge, so uh, I, I consider it a, a great privilege to get your ear for a little while. Uh, and also, you're not alone. If you haven't written a lot of essays before, you are not alone. See this. Okay. Uh, this is another one. So should we do blind assessment? I forgot to even explain this, so I'm, I'm amazed that the, the, the results were this clear cut. But uh, so last year, and I guess because of this result is so strong, this year again, we'll do blind assessment on your short written assignment and your final assignment. What that means for you is that the TA will not see your name associated with your assignment. It struck me over the years of marking undergraduate essays that every one of them had this bit of superfluous information on it. So your name, which gives me information about your gender and like where your father's family has been in the last little while. And I don't think those, that information should be relevant to how well you did on the assignment, right? It should neither make it easier for you nor harder for you given what your name is. So. Uh, I would always have to mentally filter that out, to try to attempt to mentally filter out what I knew about you as an individual while assessing your work. So this is one way that we can do that to not have to mentally filter out those facts. We can actually not have that information about you while the TAs are assessing your work. Uh, I think we can't, for administrative reasons, blind the midterm or the final exam. Your names have to be on those ones just because that's the way it's always done, and the, the, I believe the rules say we have to do that. But for the, let's say, more subjective grading on the written assignments, we can do that. And for you, all that means is you will, in, so the file name that you upload to Blackboard should start with your student number, and then whatever else you want to put after that, it's fine, whatever comes after that. And inside the file, you should include your student number and not your name. So just simply do not include your name in the file name or in the file itself. Uh, and then I'll download those all and transmit them to the TA, who will mark them, and then I'll re-upload them. 
Does that sound good? OK, good. So we're going to do blind assessment on this stuff. Uh, it's more clicking for me. It's kind of harder to match up student numbers and names, but I, hopefully it'll be worthwhile. OK, any questions about that? Good. All right, so now we're getting to the questions where we're sort of asked your opinion about big course issues. So is scientific research influenced by human values? And a big majority of you said uh, either yes or I'm not quite sure, which uh, means that for the first half of this course, I'm more or less preaching to the choir, which is nice. I, I know I'm not uh, talking to a hostile audience who vehemently disagree with me. Some people did strongly disagree. Uh, but the mo most of you think that science can be influenced by values. I would point out that that leaves a wide variation, possibilities for variation on how you think values influence the scientific process. So you could, the people who strongly agree, agree uh, could think that it influences science in a negative way or a positive way. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot left un, sort of tested by this question, but uh, I find it somewhat reassuring that I'm not fighting a totally uphill battle to convince you of this thing that, yeah, that values can have an influence on science. So, good. Uh, this was, I was fairly surprised by this. So, again, a majority of you think that science can tell us what we ought to value. Uh, and philosophers would be horrified. To, 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 the general philosophical community would be horrified to see that you think this. Um, I'm not going to particularly try to disabuse you of this either. I, I think that there's a reasonable case to be made for this if you make the case in a sufficiently subtle and sophisticated way. So there are naive ways. I'll, I'll, I'll argue, and you can think whatever you want after I'm done arguing, but I'll argue that there are naive ways in which you can think that science can tell us what we ought to value, and there are sophisticated ways. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll know about both of them, and you can decide for yourself what you think. Okay. Uh, and then we get into a bunch of, so those are the two main course questions, what you thought about them. Uh, and then we get in a bunch of just sort of diagnostic questions about your overall thoughts and feelings about how science and culture are related. A course like this often takes on these questions as sort of the main issues that they talk about, so the relationship between politics and society and science. Uh, so climate change is a fiction created for political reasons. I misspelled political, but anyway. Uh, so there's a, there's a fair distribution on this. Um, and again, if you ask people more specific questions, you would probably get different answers. Uh, I'm somewhat surprised to see that this, there's this much disagreement on this point, or this, this much uh, agreement. Did I, did I get that right? Oh well. I'm going to check that. I'm not, I'm not sure that's <laughs> that, I'm not sure I uploaded the right graph here. Let me double check that. But uh, anyway, so uh, another one, human beings evolved o our current form over millions of years unguided by any intelligent designer. Uh, and a majority of you agreed. Uh, there was a substantial portion of you who are sort of in the middle on this one. And I phrase this question the way I did uh, because there's a lot of, so the, for example, the Catholic Church would say yes to this. Or sorry, uh, they would say no. They would say that we're, we're guided by an intelligent designer, but that evolution is actually a thing that happened. So that Catholic Church has said, yes, evolution totally happened. That's how we got here. But that God was kind of in the background guiding things. So it could be the case that some of the people who disagree or strongly disagree are in that camp. Although, even uh, like it's a stronger trend in the States, but even in Canada, a substantial portion of the population doesn't think that evolution happened at all. So there's definitely some of those people in the disagree and strongly disagree categories here. Just for FYI. Uh, this is a mean question, the totally mean question to psychologists. Uh, do you think psychology is a science, agree or disagree? Uh, most of you agree that psychology is, in fact, a science. Uh, some of you thought not. Uh, I, of course, it depends on what you mean by science and whether you think that there can be such a thing as a bad science or like a science that's not as good as other sciences. There tends to be a lot of hate for psychology, and I'm, I'm, I feel bad for them because they have one of the most complex topics on the planet, us. Uh, and they're doing their best. I mean, <laughs> they're doing their best on this incredibly complicated and difficult subject, which is also incredibly important. Like, particle physicists, you know, go you, you're learning about the most fundamental features of reality, but you have very little to say to me as a human being about, like, how I should live. 
whereas psychologists do have a lot to say about us as human beings. So they're doing something really difficult. And I'll try to show you in this lecture uh, at least one example of psychology trying to step up its game in terms of how rigorous it is. So they've had a, what they call it a replication crisis recently, and they're trying to uh, get past it by asking hard questions about psychology as a discipline. So they're, they're trying to shift this more to the psychology as a science side of things. Uh, religion and science cover separate topics. They are not in competition with, with each other. Uh, this is interestingly distributed. Um, I suppose it depends on the religion and exactly how you interpret it. But so that's interesting. This is another one. I threw this in here because it's one of the big topics that often gets discussed in this course. I'm really not going to pursue this in this particular version of science and values, but interesting to think about. Uh, and if you're reading these questions, choose disagree. 97% of you chose disagree. So thank you. Well done. Thank you for reading the questions. Exactly two people. One person neither agreed nor disagreed, and one person strongly agreed. Uh, and it's never clear to me. It's never clear to me whether this person is not reading the question or if they're just kind of a sociopath who feels the need to buck any. You did, as a group, rate obedience very low on your list of values. So I'm, so, I'm sort of surprised that there weren't more people trying to d disrupt the process here. But uh, this is something to keep in mind if you're ever dealing with large groups of people. In any group of more than 100 people, in my experience, there'll be like 1% or 2% that do something that's just really unexpected and odd. Uh, so there's that. Uh, here's a big one. So science is making progress towards the truth about our universe. So this is a test to see whether you're what co philosophers call a scientific realist. So some people think that science is just a useful set of tools. It's not that they deny that they're useful, but that they deny that science is getting at some kind of fundamental bedrock truth. Uh, so those are scientific anti-realists or instrumentalists. They say, yeah, yeah, science is wicked handy. It's really, really useful, but it's not getting at the truth. It's just getting at more and more useful tools and tricks and methods. Uh, it seems that most of you are on the scientific realist side of things that say science is actually getting, well, making at least some kind of progress towards the truth about reality. Uh, that's what I think, too, so we can be buddies. Uh, Anyway, okay, and uh, science is the only basis for rational knowledge. This is a, it's distributed like a bell curve on this one. Um, this one hurts, hurts my feelings a little to see how many of you disagree with this, or, or how, many of, how many of you agree with this, because I'm in a non-scientific discipline, and I'm, I'm trying to generate knowledge. I'm trying to generate rational knowledge and philosophy. Uh, so things like, it depends on what you call science, but most people don't call philosophy science. We don't do experiments, really. We don't like collect data or make observations. Uh, very seldomly do we come up with testable hypotheses either. So philosophy usually gets counted as not part of science. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little hurt, but we'll, we'll, it'll, it'll be OK. All right, so uh, that's it. All right, so that was the surveys. Uh, check out the, I posted a PDF of those online if you want to take a longer look at them. And I posted the results of the Rokic value surveys uh, on the Blackboard as well. I think they're fascinating. So thank you, by the way, for doing that. It's kind of a weird thing for me to ask you to do, especially the value survey. Uh, but I hope it was at least somewhat interesting for you. I hope that you did at least some reflection on what your values are. Uh, it was mostly a way for me to get you to look at a list of 30 th 36 things that count as values. Uh, but it was also, hopefully, something to get you to reflect at least a little bit on what you think is important in life, which is a worthwhile thing to do. OK, so that's the surveys. Uh, it's not too late to do them if you haven't done them yet and get almost all of the credit for it. Do you have any uh, questions about the course mechanics before I get into the lecture proper? OK, good. Uh, also, I last time, la the last lecture, I was successfully able to uh, capture the timing of the slides and combine it with the recording of my voice and put it on YouTube. So there's a link to the last lecture with audio and slides 
uh, on Blackboard, so you can watch it at your leisure. Um, this is kind of a possibly dangerous thing to do to you. I mean, on the one hand, it's hard for me to imagine making the information more accessible, causing you to have a less thorough education. But on the other hand, here's a trap that you might get yourself into. You might say, ah, well, these lectures are going to be online, so I never have to go. And then you'll have a very busy life, and you'll say, well, I don't have to watch these things now. I can watch them later. And then it'll be the night before the exam, and you won't have watched any of them yet. And you'll think, ah, I can just cram all this in at the very last minute. I mean, it's not that you're irrational. It's just that you're all busy people and have a lot of stuff on your plate. So the temptation to fall behind is going to be large. And I don't know how to protect you from that freedom that I'm offering you here. Uh, I strongly recommend that you, you've all shown up to class, so thank you. Uh, I strongly recommend that you continue to do so. It's the best way to get yourself to pay attention and to process this stuff deeply, and then watching it again online would be even better. Uh, so my very strong recommendation is that you keep showing up. Uh, if you're sick one day and have to just rely on the recording, that's, I mean, that's what it's there for. OK? So please keep showing up. For one thing, you get to ask clarificatory questions while you're here. So you won't get that opportunity if you don't show up. Uh, and another, it really is much, much better for your ability to process the information if you are forced to sit still and just listen for the course of the lecture. So uh, also, we've, are, we've had two people offer to uh, be note takers for this course, which is unprecedented in my experience. I've never had more than one person step up. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, I think that's all of the course stuff. So let's dive into this. Okay, uh, so last time I left, probably left many of you in a confused state about subjectivity and objectivity. At least a couple of people came up to me in class where uh, saying that I had been a bit unclear, and that's probably right. So let's let's start there. Uh, and we're gonna. So this class, we're basically gonna do just chapter one of Grinnell, where he lays out his picture of science. Uh, and the point of this lecture is just going to be to show you that if you have a reasonably sophisticated picture of how science works, there's all kinds of opportunities for values to be operative in the process. Right. So all we're doing this lecture really is showing that. Uh, if you consider science in any kind of reasonably sophisticated way, uh, the, there are all kinds of points in the process where values are potentially relevant. Uh, and then next week we'll do chapters two and three where we talk about the discovery process and the credibility process where we'll get more into detail into how values actually play a role in the process. So right now we're just doing how they try to show you that they are potentially relevant, values are potentially relevant in the scientific method, and then next week, we'll talk about how they might actually be relevant in two different ways. OK. So is science objective? I take it that that's basically the question of the course, right? Uh, well, this first half of the course, at least. And Grinnell offers this really counterintuitive sounding proposal, which is that uh, scientific objectivity is produced as a social product right? from the interacting subjectivities of science, scientists. So, Scientists all have their point of views, they have their interests, they have their goals, and somehow, through this process of scientific reasoning, these, a whole bunch of people's subjective views kind of produce objective facts. This is the, this is the claim of Grinnell, and it sounds like a paradox if you just say it like that, right? It sounds like making gold out of lead. Right? Some kind of weird alchemy, because how can you turn something subjective into something objective? It seems impossible. Uh, but that's exactly what he claims that science does. Uh, to reduce the sort of paradoxical sounding nature of this, I think it's very helpful. And this is the distinction that I was less than fully clear about at the end of last lecture. So let's do it again. Uh, between, let's distinguish between subjectivity, two kinds of objectivity, and intersubjectivity. So subjectivity is something, uh, a fact is subjective if its truth depends upon a specific subject. So all of you did the Rokic values surveys. Those values are subjective in the sense that you all offered different answers, right? So it's not, it's not the case that there was just one true answer for which one, which value is most important, right? So 
something is subjective if we differ on it, right? And that there's no, there's no fact of the matter that would tell you that this person is right and that person is wrong. Okay. Now there's two senses of objectivity that we could consider. One of them I would like to argue is kind of just incoherent, or at least uh, so far outside of what any of us could possibly hope to access that it's irrelevant. Uh, and that's sub objectivity one, something that is not depending on any subject. Right? So if something is objective in this sense, if it has no relation if between, if, if there's no relation between it and a subject, a per per person with a point of view. Uh, and if that's what you want, I recommend that you give up because uh, as, I, as the, the band said, all you touch and all you see is all your life will ever be. Right? There's nothing that you're ever going to experience in your life that doesn't get mediated through your subjectivity. Right? That's just not possible. So if you want objectivity in any sense, you should want objectivity too, which is something that doesn't depend on any specific subject. Right? So not something that's subjectivity free, but something that's, sh that's uh, not sort of like dependent on one person rather than another, something that's subject neutral rather than subject free. And that's pretty much the same. So objectivity two and intersubjectivity, I think, are just kind of two different ways of saying the same thing. Right? So something is intersubjectively valid if it's shared amongst all subjects or many subjects or most subjects or something like that. So the degree of intersubjective uh, agreement is how much is it the case that everybody shares it. So it doesn't depend on your particularities, your life history, your specific culture, anything like that. Uh, something is intersubjective, uh, uh, something is intersubjectively valid just in case it's shared amongst all subjects. Is that fairly clear? Clearer than last time? I hope so. So it's these, it's objectivity to or intersubjectivity that Grinnell thinks can be the product of the scientific process. And so the scientific process takes things that start off as not verified, not necessarily reliable, from a certain point of view, you know, it's a selective fact, and by going through this process can sort of turn it into something that's intersubjectively reliable. Yeah, question. Ah, so is our mathematics purely objective? Um, that is a matter of great debate amongst philosophers. Uh, it, it, objective in which sense? In the sense that any specific person can look at, you know, a mathematical theory and then be able to like interpret it the exact same way. Good. So, uh, is mathematics intersubjectively valid? I would say yes, certainly, uh, that mathematics is one of those things that it really doesn't matter too much which culture you're a part of. So like the Pythagorean theorem, for example, was discovered by the Babylonians, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Indians, ancient Greek, ancient Egyptians, like a whole bunch of different cultures using radically different uh, symbols and words all came up with the same equality, right? So a right angle triangle has the sides of the following lengths, right? So Everybody came up with the same thing, which makes it intersubjective. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that Grinnell is using objectivity and intersubjectivity interchangeably, or is he still saying that they're different things? Uh, so the question. Is intersubjectivity another way in his case of calling it subjective? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, is, is does Grinnell think objectivity too and intersubjectivity are just the same thing? Uh, it's not super obvious to me. I think that he is. I think he's using these interchangeably. And when he says objectivity, what he means is intersubjectivity. Uh, yeah, I don't see any difference between objectivity two for him and intersubjectivity. Yeah. So kind of, kind of basically saying the same thing, as far as I can tell. Uh, he might pause it. So like, one of the tricks about intersubjectivity, however, is that everybody can be wrong. Like, just because everybody agrees doesn't mean that everybody's right. And that's one of the things that you wanted from objectivity was that you can't be wrong. If something's objectively true, you can't be wrong about it. 
uh, or that if you know the object of truth, you can't be wrong. Whereas uh, it was, to use, the, to use the example of math again, it was commonly understood by everybody for most of history that Euclidean geometry, geometry in which parallel lines never meet, was the only kind of geometry. Everybody said, yeah, Euclidean geometry, that's the geometry that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, and turns out not so much. Turns out uh, the basis of theory of general relativity and a whole bunch of fancy math that we do now is non-Euclidean geometry. So everybody agreed, but everybody was wrong. Uh, so it's hard to tell when you've just got intersubjective agreement and when you've got something that's just as a matter of mind independent fact true. Um, and as far as I know, as far as I can tell, we're just sort of stuck with that fact. Like intersubjectivity is all we're gonna, ever gonna get. And it could just be that we are somehow, you know, cognitively limited in some way, right? That we just can't imagine the truth. Uh, if you look at other animals, you can see their cognitive limitations in a really stark and dramatic way. So like my cat is never gonna learn calculus. She's just not, right? She's never gonna, she barely understands doors, right? She's never gonna get calculus, no matter how much I harass her about it. Uh, so the, my cat has just a very obvious set of cognitive limitations that she's never going to overcome. And I don't know what the argument could be to say that we're not like that two, right? That we just don't have cognitive limitations that our human brains will just never overcome. And that means that you could have intersubjective agreement to the end of time, intersubjective agreement, but not actually be at some kind of mind independent truth. Kind of depressing, but there you have it. This is just the best we're going to do as far as I can tell. I, I would love to be proven wrong about that. I would love to have some some reason to believe that we're going to someday just get to the big T truth. Uh, but I don't know of any convincing argument to that effect. OK, so that's subjectivity, objectivity, and intersubjectivity. And Grinnell's big claim is that what science does is take things that start off in the subjective realm and then kind of launder them thoroughly in a social process until they're intersubjectively agreed upon and reliable. Excuse me. Okay. So, uh, you recall this slide from last time. Uh, the question is, so for the, for the purposes of the rest of this class, as I said before, what we're gonna talk about is uh, the scientific process and Grinnell's got two models of the scientific process that he advances. And he says in one, in the oversimplified model, it's not obvious how science could involve values, right? Science from the, what he calls the linear model is gonna look like two plus five equals seven, where there's really just not any place, there's no place for science to play, or for values to play a role in that equation. And so I don't care what you think, I don't care you know, whether you think love is more important than wisdom, that's just true. The end, like if you know how those symbols are used, how, what they mean, then you should agree that that's true. Whereas what Grinnell's gonna say is that if we have a, so it might be, you might be tempted to think that science is like this, right? Science is like two plus five equals seven. There's just no space in the process for values to play a role. Uh, but, Grindle's going to argue that issues like when is it okay to exclude data points, what projects should get funding, what methodologies are reliable, and how should we conduct meta-analyses, that kind of question. There's a whole litany of different questions, but these are some, are points at which the process is unlike 2, point, 2 plus 5 equals 7, where there are open questions where decisions need to be made, decisions about where to spend time, energy, and resources, which recall, that's what values really are according to the way we're gonna talk in this class, values are your picture of where you should be spending time, energy, resources. So what goals should you formulate and how should you mobilize the, res the limited resources that you have to pursue those goals? And these questions are unclear enough or that they're open enough that you actually have to have some kind of value structure to approach them. So 
here are the two models of science. Uh, the one on the left there is the linear model, where you observe a thing, and then you write it down. The end. Uh, the one on the right is what Grinnell calls his, what does he call it, his uh, circular model? Two conversations model, I believe he calls it. Cyclical model is what he calls it, sorry. So this is Grinnell's cyclical model. The linear model is more or less the model that you get taught in elementary school. Uh, it's the science fair model of science. The cyclical model is this much more complicated thing and it much more accurately represents how science actually works in the world. Uh, I'm sure that you're all aware of this. So again, we're doing facts here that really you're probably all or virtually all aware of. Nobody, none of you think that the linear model is true, uh, but it might be the case that you haven't considered, you haven't put the facts that you already know together in precisely this way before to think about how something more complicated, a more complicated picture of science opens up the possibility that values can play a role. So and again, uh, so this class we're just, we're just talking about his overall picture of science. On Monday we'll talk about discovery more particularly and then we'll talk about credibility on Wednesday. Uh, but the overall picture, the basic picture, is that we should consider from the perspective of an individual scientist, uh, their kind of cyclical relationship with the world that they're studying. So they're performing experiments, uh, they're making observations, they're formulating hypotheses, right? So that's this relationship between the individual scientist and the world. And then they've got another relationship with their, with their broader research community. Uh, so uh, they're, even after they've sort of completed a experiment or a run of experiments, even after they've made some fantastic observation, uh, they still have to convince everybody else that what they've got is worthwhile, that it's uh, uh, not just something that they think, but something that everybody should think. So this is the process of taking, so, in this discovery process, you're more or less making claims that are not quite science yet from Grinnell's point of view. Uh, and it's only the credibility process that takes something that could be potentially subjective and turns it into something intersubjective. Should be, should be all right? Everyone's all right with that? Okay. So, uh, can I, can I see a show of hands? Who here was made to do a science fair at school? Okay, some of you, not all of you. I found this to be a profoundly irritating uh, exercise because it, it radic and Grinnell finds it irritating as well because it radically distorts how science actually works. Uh, and furthermore, what elementary school student is actually equipped to investigate the world scientifically? I don't, I don't think that's a realistic expectation. So they're not even teaching you how science works. They're teaching you just how to fabricate a research project or something like that. So uh, the science fair model works like this. You ask a question, you formulate a hypothesis about what the answer is going to be, run an experiment, write down the results, and then tell people the results. The end. Right? There's no attempt at replication. There's no attempt at critique. There's no attempt at sort of like understanding the limitations of your research program. Uh, I guess somebody comes around and looks at the Bristol board thing that you did, but that's it, right? They just put, they stick a mark on it and that's the end. Uh, so if this is your picture of science, and again, I doubt that anybody in this room believes that this is how science works in general, but uh, if this is the picture of science that you're working with, it can be fairly hard to see how values could play a role, right? It, it's just a matter of like, if you, if, you if you executed the experiment reasonably fairly, there's just no, no place in the process for any of the complicated questions that Grinnell's gonna say involve uh, values to, to be part of the story. Uh, and furthermore, there is a kind of elementary value neutrality in the linear model that is in incredibly important. Like it's, it's a, there's a kind of, baseline value neutrality without which science could not proceed. So if somebody intentionally, suppose your ex science experiment is like growing plants, uh, you would have been more organized than I was because growing plants takes time, but uh, suppose you're trying to figure out what makes plants grow more. Uh, 
if you like water one more intentionally and give it better light and better fertilizer and don't include that in your experiment, then you've tipped the scales in favor of one of your, one of your uh, research subjects over another and you've not been neutral in the right way, right? So you need to be objective in this really minimal sense of not trying to influence the outcome of the experiment one way or the other, right? And it's a, you know, this is just elementary fairness, elementary like objectivity in the sense of trying to not create the result that you were looking for. So science must be objective, at least in this minimal sense, or you're kind of not doing science anymore. You're doing marketing or something like that. Like when they do, uh, do they still have ads on TV where they've got two kinds of uh, paper towel and they show you that one of them is better at absorbing liquid than the other? So probably those guys were not doing a totally objective test to see which of those towels is objectively better at picking up water. Probably they were tipping the scales in various ways, trying to make their thing look like the best. Of course, of, of course they are. They're not doing science, they're doing marketing. Uh, so a, f a fundamental requirement for doing science is that you're objective, at least in this minimal sense. And so my, my worry is that the broad public, the people who aren't really interested in science, people who re aren't really engaged in the process, remember their elementary school science fairs and think, well, that's gotta be objective. So science must be objective or they're doing it wrong, right? Uh, this distorted picture that we have of how science works kind of starts in elementary school. Uh, and again, they're not wrong that it has to be objective in this sense, but this picture of how science works is really just radically, radically simplified. Right? Radically simplified beyond the point where it kind of resembles how science works in the real world at all. Uh, and what Grinnell says is that this, this impression that we have of the linear model of science, the kind of uh, value neutral version of the scientific method, is not helped along by the way that, let's say, non-scientist consumers of science, like myself, uh, are presented with scientific knowledge, right? So the standard way of presenting scientific knowledge is in s textbooks, like that's, that's where I saw most of my, the things that I know about science mostly came out of textbooks uh, or more sophisticated, but still not that sophisticated, are journal articles. And both of these present, they don't present to you the messy, complicated, s sort of circular back and forth of how these facts were generated. And so the, the process that generated the facts that make up a textbook have this really uh, Byzantine maze-like process that came up with them, uh, where people had to be passionate advocates for their ideas. They had to stick to their ideas despite evidence telling them that they're wrong. They had to, you know, they had to ignore criticisms, legit criticisms that could have sunk their project until they had an, enough evidence to convince their community. So the textbook presents you with a fact in this pure, you know, shiny, neatly packaged way. And uh, it erases the whole process of coming up with that fact. So if you're just judging how science works based on how its final, final products are presented to you, again, it might look to you like it's a completely value neutral process. Uh, and Grinnell sort of extends this to journal, the way journal articles are structured as well. So a journal article starts with, it kind of looks like the science fair model, doesn't it? So the journal article starts with, here's a question. Here was our hypothesis. We tested it. Here are the results. The end. Right? Uh, but that's, again, Grinnell argues, a radically cleaned up version of what actually took place. So they don't tell you about the experiments that didn't work. They don't tell you about the experiments where they just had one instrument calibrated wrong and it produced the wrong result. They don't tell you about the time that they were unable to replicate the famous result uh, and didn't know why. And they don't tell you about the time that the effect that they thought they were finding just mysteriously disappeared for no reason that anybody could figure out. So they don't include any of that complexity and the complex decisions that have to be made in order to get to these nice, neatly packaged results uh, 
in either the textbook or the journal article format. Right? They're cleaned up for you. And you want them to be cleaned up. Like, it's not like I'm advocating that uh, every textbook include the life history of every scientist that came up with the, with the ideas. Right? You don't want that. What you want are the finished products when you're at the stage in your education where you're just trying to learn you know, what are the basic facts of the matter, what are the things that everybody already agrees upon. But what Grinnell wants to call your attention to is that these products are the end result of a very long process that's much, much more complicated than they make it look. Okay. So he gives this really nice example of a textbook fact, the way it's presented as a textbook fact. So mRNA mediates between DNA and proteins. Uh, I'll, I'll explain this for the poor humanities students in the, in the room. I'm sure all of you scientists are fully aware of what that means. But uh, so DNA, of course, every one of your cells has DNA in it. Uh, and your DNA codes for proteins. That is, your DNA tells your uh, body how to make proteins. And uh, between, but between the DNA and the little machine in your cells that makes the proteins, you have this messenger RNA. So the, the DNA gets copied onto uh, another kind of molecule called RNA. And that RNA gets fed into a ribosome, which then synthesizes a DNA. This is a big discovery. This is a discovery they made in the 1960s. Uh, it's very exciting because they learned an important part of the process of how DNA gets turned into us. So when you read the textbook, it says mRNA mediates between DNA and proteins. The end. Great. Uh, and you might get the impression that they just sort of looked in a cell and saw this happening, and there it is. That's just the fact of the matter. Uh, but he, he uh, emphasizes, so Grinnell emphasizes, that uh, this discovery process was not straightforward, and the credibility process was neither, straight, was not, neither was straightforward. So this very simple textbook fact uh, starts off in the hands of what he calls Professor Particular. And only through the credibility process gets transformed into the shiny textbook version of Professor Anybody. So this is his cute way of talking about the process by which subjective claims. This is Grinnell, by the way, himself. So I thought I'd stick him in as Professor Particular. And this is not anybody. That's clip art, in case you're curious. Uh, so the, the the process by which uh, the textbook fact gets generated. So the textbook fact is a product of Professor Anybody, but it started off in the hands of Professor Particular, some individual scientist who has career ambitions, they have things they think are important, they have pet hypotheses, you know, they have a bunch of subjective, in the sense of not shared amongst everybody, goals and values. And it's just having done the observation, just looking at the biochemistry of it, does not automatically get you to professor anybody. Right? So just having made the observation is part of a, the beginning of a process by which it, these facts are slowly laundered into intersubjectivity. So Grinnell says, the initial discovery claim should be considered proto-science. So, you may be wearing a lab coat, you may be holding a beaker, you may have run an experiment, and you may have even discovered something. But even at that point, Grinnell says, you're not yet making a scientific claim. It should be, should be considered proto-science, sort of a pre-scientific claim. And it's only after the credibility process that we get to call something a scientific fact. In the sense that you know, science is supposed to be, calling something a scientific fact is supposed to be to, to give it some kind of credibility and authority. That's usually how people use that word. So before you call something a scientific fact, it's not enough that somebody who has a PhD and was wearing a lab coat said so. It's that it has to have made it through the social process of making something certified, sort of uh, credit, making it credible through the peer review and social process. Uh, and Grinnell emphasizes the way in which individual scientists have to care about their theory. So this is in the discovery phase. So that was the credibility phase. In the, even in the discovery phase, individual scientists have to actually care about their theories. And that's, again, it might be if you're, if you're used to the sort of uh, pop 
pop TV show version of science that might strike you as uh, anti-scientific, right? Scientists are supposed to be totally dispassionate. They're not supposed to care which way it goes one way or the other. You're certainly not supposed to, in your science fair project, care what the right outcome is. You're not supposed to advocate for your theory. You're supposed to be a totally dispassionate receiver of facts, which then get written down and summarized in nice statistical tables from which we extract regularities. That's supposed to be how it goes. Not that a scientist is convinced, despite what the evidence says, uh, of the correctness of their theory and will keep experimenting and experimenting until they prove themselves right or they stop getting funding. Right? That's not how it's supposed to go. But as a matter of fact, that is how it goes. So uh, there's this widespread misreading of this really famous philosopher of science, Karl Popper, uh, which says that if the experiment doesn't confirm the theory, we immediately throw the theory out. Right? So this is called, the, the broad view is called falsificationism, which is that Scientific theories are good to the extent that they survive attempts to prove them wrong. And that's a, that's a philosophical view of how science works with a considerable deal of merit. It's a, it's a good view. It's not the only view, but it's a, it's a good one. Uh, but there's a kind of naive view of this where if the scientist is proven wrong by one experiment, they go, ah, well, obviously it's false. Let's move on. Uh, and that's simply not how science actually works. So he quotes the Nobel Prize winner, Francois Jacob, uh, on precisely the, he's one of the people that actually discovered the mediating role of mRNA between DNA and protein. So that's nice, shiny textbook fact that we, uh, that we started from. Here's the, here's the way he describes the process of coming up with that fact. So he says, we were, we were to do very long, very arduous experiments, but nothing worked. We had tremendous technical problems. So he's doing experiment after experiment, and it's not working, right? So he's not just saying, ah, well, the end then, I guess I don't know anything. Uh, he says, full of energy and excitement, sure of the correctness of our hypothesis, we started our experiment over and over again, modifying it slightly, changing some technical detail. So this is, okay, and this is not just some, some schmuck. This guy won a Nobel Prize. Like this is as high as you can go on the sort of status hierarchy of science. This is as good as it can get. I hope some of you like someday come close to this in terms of your career as a scientist. I hope one of you wins a Nobel Prize. That's as, that's as prestigious as it gets. And here's this guy with this nice shiny textbook fact uh, saying that, you know, w despite the results of our experiment, we persisted. Despite what the data was telling us, we kept going over and over again until we proved ourselves right. And that's the story of how we came to know that mRNA mediates between DNA and protein. Uh, this now, you know, what is it, like 50 years later, this is in the 60s, uh, everybody agrees on this. This is an intersubjectively reliable claim. No serious scientist disputes the fact that MNR mRNA mediates between DNA and the protein synthesis process. But the process to get there was like this, was like this you know, passion project. The, the scientist involved had to really care about his hypothesis. He had to resist naive falsificationism. He didn't, didn't resist falsificationism in a kind of sophisticated way where it's not the first experiment that proves you wrong that says you should give up. It's that if repeated experiments by a bunch of different people from a bunch of different perspectives tell you you're wrong, then you should give up. Uh, but he resisted naive falsificationism and eventually came through to make this amazing discovery. So this is the sense in which the discovery process for Grinnell involves values. Right? It involves caring about your hypothesis, and it involves knowing how much energy to spend. So think about the decision that this person had to make. How much energy should I spend on this hypothesis? How hard should I ask this question? How hard should I push back against the technical problems, the failed experiments? That's a decision that involves how much you care about it, right? What, what importance do you put on it, and what do you value in the process? Probably won't use up the rest of this second hour, but that's fine. So we're just going to go through. Uh, Grinnell pre presents this really nice chart summarizing the differences between uh, the picture of science that he wants you to start from and the kind of classic uh, linear or science fair model of how science works. Uh, summarizing the differences. And for the rest of the lecture, we're just going to go through 
kind of examples of each of these. And once again, the point of this is really just to show you, uh, like, again, probably you all have the more sophisticated view of science in mind when you think about how science works. Like, you're all aware that there's a peer review process and stuff like that. Uh, but it's helpful to go through these and see some of the points at which values can potentially play a role in the scientific process at various points. Uh, and then next Monday and next Wednesday, we'll get into more detail about how values actually play a role. Not just potentially, we're doing this class, but actually play a concrete role in first the discovery process and then the credibility process. So the classic view says <clears throat> you go like this. Here's how science works. You state the problem. You carry out an experiment. You conclude whether the observations confirm or disconfirm. And then you seek verification through replication. This is a little bit better than the science fair model because you're at least asking other people to like do the same experiment over again. But, Grinnell says, uh, the ambiguous view, he calls it, uh, it's poorly titled, but anyway, uh, the ambiguous view uh, is, requires us to acknowledge the following facts. For example, choosing a problem is investing time, money, and et cetera in it. So our choice of problem is the first place at which values potentially play a role in the scientific process. Hypotheses do not fall out of the sky. Right? They're not handed to you by nature on a silver platter. You have to come up with the question to be asked. And coming up with a question is actually an, a profoundly creative act. Right? It's not just something that's handed to you. It's, it's something that you generate. And generating good, interesting, novel questions is an art form. There is no science of hypothesis generation. Well, there's some areas where it's starting to be. Actually, there are some areas in which uh, if, the, if the problem is well constrained enough, they're starting to uh, hand this off to machine learning, which is fascinating. So some very constrained areas in which hypothesis generation can be mechanized. But in general, uh, it's not the case that the questions just present themselves and you have to know what's important in order to come up with a question. Uh, similarly, when you're carrying out experiments, uh, it's often the case that the important results are not the ones that you were looking for. Uh, the history of science is just riddled with cases where the, the scientist was investigating one thing and discovered something else. And it was only their powers of noticing. We recall we're going to talk about the problem of noticing quite a bit uh, on Monday. Uh, their powers of noticing something new uh, were what let them discover this thing. Okay. Uh, furthermore, we don't simply conclude whether the results confirmed or disconfirmed our hypothesis and leave it at that. Uh, again, this Nobel Prize winner, uh, Jacob, did not give up when the experiments were not working. Uh, they did not simply throw up their hands and say, okay, well, I guess I'm wrong. Uh, Grinnell says, don't give up on a good idea just because the data don't fit. Uh, that's putting it dramatically, uh, but it's got a kernel of truth to it. You don't simply give up on the first run of your experiment. And it's a matter of judgment, of human judgment, when it is appropriate to give up on a hypothesis and when it's not. And finally, uh, seek verification through replication. Scientists don't simply throw their idea out and say, what do you think? Often it's the case that they have to convince other scientists to even take a look at their idea. So they have to become kind of professional advocates in their local community, uh, their local scientific community for their idea to convince other people to spend their very limited grant money, grad student time and attention, uh, lab space, and all of that stuff to do a replication study or something like that. Like, so they have to, they have to add, positively advocate for their work, sometimes beyond what's strictly speaking justified by the experiments they've already done. So they're convinced of this idea, and they have to go to bat for it uh, to get more data to actually see whether they're right or not. And that's, again, this is not a failure of the virtues of scientists. This is how it's done. OK, so we're going to go through each four of these and kind of just do examples, and that'll be it for the day. So. Stating the problem. So here's a really dramatic example of a, where uh, there's, this, there's this humongous skew 
in the kind of questions that medical science asks. Uh, it might be a little bit generous to call medicine a science. It's more like an engineering problem because we're not trying to like, not necessarily trying to come up with the ultimate theory of the common cold or anything like that. We're just trying to find effective interventions like engineers do. But uh, medicine certainly styles itself as a science, so let's treat it like one. Uh, the 1090 gap is this gap between how much money is spent on researching diseases of affluence, like uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, the kind of things that are like late, late stage uh, dementia, that kind of thing, the things that affect you if you've had a nice, comfortable, long life. Uh, so 90% of research money gets spent on that, and about 10% of research money gets spent on things that kill millions of people every year, like malaria. Uh, so the kind, of, the kind of questions that are being asked, uh, and not just asked, but like people are asking the questions, how do you cure malaria? But the kind of the, the attention and energy and resources that are being spent on these different questions differs dramatically, dramatically. And this is, I think this is a really clear example of values playing a role in the kind of questions that we ask. Uh, specifically, it's mostly people in rich countries doing the research and they're more interested in their own problems than the problems of people who are far away from them. Um, so there's, there is some debate on uh, the exact numbers here. So 1090 is probably not a, don't take that to the bank as exactly how much money is spent on each one of these. Generally, there's agreement that there's a big gap between how much money is spent on diseases that affect people who are generally rich versus how much money is spent on people who are generally poor. So stating the problem is not trivial. S stating and like, identifying what you should be researching is a huge part of the scientific process, and it has big results for what kind of science we're doing and the, the broad direction of our, our research programs. Uh, similarly, it's a very interesting uh, paper out in Nature just recently uh, saying in 2006, 24% of Canadian scientists did basic research, that is like research into just like uh, fundamental scientific questions with no obvious practical application. And in 2015, 1.5% did basic research. So here's a values question for you. Should we be spending our money on uh, so these are you know, people at universities, so taxpayer-funded researchers. You are all subsidizing this research. And the question is, should we be spending our money doing uh, research with obvious, direct, practical applications? Or should we be doing research that kind of enriches humanity by discovering novel, basic scientific facts? Um, and I don't propose to answer that for you. I, I'm not quite sure what the answer is. I'm keen on like solving human problems, but I also think there's a great deal of value in doing basic research and that basic research often has uh, unexpected practical benefits. So here's just another example of questions where it's not obvious where we should start the scientific process. Right? Where you start will make a big downstream difference and there's no scientific fact that decides where we should start, right? There's no, there's, no, there's no textbook that will tell you what the appropriate place to start your research project is because the research project is always at the cutting edge, right? Where the unknowns are. So uh, it's really just the only thing that can determine where we should go here are your values or your assessment of what's important. I was shocked by this, by the way. I, I was shocked by how dramatic a decline this is in basic research. Uh, it certainly represents a clear values determination by the people who are, probably by the people who are handing out the money, not by the scientists. I, I'm positive that it's not the case that 98.5% of scientists don't feel like doing basic research. I bet a much larger percentage of scientists would rather be doing kind of broad, open, investigative research. But the granting agencies who are told by the government 
and who are told by society at large have made this determination that Canadian research at least is going to take a pretty definite turn towards the uh, applied research rather than basic research. So something to think about. Right. So the step of carrying out experiments or making observations. Uh, as I mentioned before, many discoveries are made by chance while an experiment is being read, uh, run on something else. Uh, the discovery of x-rays was like this. So they were doing, a guy was doing research on cathode ray tubes and he noticed that a screen nearby was glowing green. He thought, oh, that's interesting and got himself a Nobel Prize for that. For that moment of noticing, got himself a Nobel Prize. Uh, and we'll talk Again, we'll talk on Monday about the problem of noticing, the problem of figuring out what to notice. Uh, we briefly sort of hinted at that in the first lecture where I showed you a picture of a living room and said, what do you notice about this? So your goals help structure your perception. It's perceiving as a kind of behavior, your goals structure your behavior, and, so, and your values structure your goals. So your values downstream structure your perception and what you think is interesting or important. Uh, furthermore, your values can be sort of given to you. So the, uh, your, what you think is important or interesting or the process by which you notice things is not something that you sort of as an individual decide for yourself because science is no longer an individual activity. It might have been two, three hundred years ago. It's no longer the case that any given scientist works by themselves. I'm not aware of any scientist who's sort of like alone in a lab. Usually we work in, they work in large groups, and usually they're working under some paradigm or other, that is some uh, accepted collection of uh, experimental techniques which uh, attack an accepted collection of types of questions. And this is by no means a finished process, like figuring out which are the right questions to ask and which are the right experiments to run is something that science is constantly working on. So uh, has, how many of you have seen this, by the way, this, this fun picture? A few. OK, good. I'm glad that only a few of you, because this is a great joy of my life. I get to share things with you. This is, from a, this is an image from a paper called Neural Correlates of Interspecies Perspective Taking in the Postmortem Atlantic Salmon. Uh, and it's kind of a, a critique of the way fMRI studies are done. So what they did for this experiment was take a dead salmon and put it in their fMRI machine. It's fully dead, it's a dead salmon, and they showed it pictures of people in different social situations, and then measured its brain activity, and found those red spots are statistically significant uh, patterns of brain activity in the dead salmon. Quite dead, not recently dead, quite dead. Okay, so the lesson that they're trying to look up this paper, by the way, this is a, this is a fabulous paper. There's lovely like wired articles. There's lovely blog, blog articles about this. Uh, the point was not in fact that uh, dead salmon have important things to think or say about uh, human social situations. The point was that fMRI studies do this thing where they, they every point is a potential uh, regularity. So if you ask the question like, is there regularity here? Is there one here? Is there one here? Is there one here? And you do that at a thousand points and consider uh, you know, your, your threshold for significance is low enough, you're going to find statistically significant patterns even in the brain of a dead salmon. Right? So uh, there's this, th what they did was they were using very standard methodologies, very standard experimental techniques that are used on the brains of alive people uh, and that often generate statistically significant results. And the question is, what should we think about that? Like, how should, how should you interpret those results? Are they telling you something very important and real and interesting about the world? Or are they just telling you that if you run enough experiments, eventually by chance, one of them will show you a statistically significant result? And you can see what they think. They think that if you run enough experiments, you'll eventually get one that shows a statistically significant result that you can then get published in a paper. And then people will treat that as a fact on which they can build new experiments. Worrying, right? This should be, this should be worrying for anybody in the field of doing fMRI studies. Right. So 
The point is not to show you that science is an unreliable process, because precisely what these people are doing is testing whether their process is reliable and sharing their results with others, right? So they're improving the scientific method by doing this sort of null hypothesis study. They're saying, OK, even if there's nothing there, do we still find a result? Yes, we did. That means the statistical methods that we're using are not good enough. Right? And this, this study gets picked up by the people who do this kind of stuff and say, ah, OK, well, we've got to We've got to step up our game, right? We've got to do more rigorous studies. We're also going to get a bunch of false positives. And this is a case where it's simply not sufficient to just do an experiment and write down the answer that you got, right? It's simply not sufficient. You have to do the right kind of experiment. The experiment has to be rigorous enough. It has to be according to a reliable methodology. And it has to be, well, I mean, so your scientific paradigm, they say, this is Thomas Kuhn's word, and we'll talk about it more. But your scientific paradigm is kind of the accepted set of experimental practices and uh, categories and ideas. It's a, it's a complicated word. But for our purposes, the paradigm is just the accepted set of experimental practices, which is constantly an object in motion. It's not the case that it's easy to believe that we've got the scientific method all worked out, that we've figured out how to do science, and it's just a matter of taking this toolkit that we've got and applying it to the world. But that's not the case. The toolkit itself is constantly under revision and needs constant checking to make sure that it hasn't gone off the rails. OK. I love this salmon study. I'm, I'm so glad I got to share that with you. All right. So the next step is to conclude whether the hypothesis was confirmed. And the burning question for the individual scientist is, did your experiment fail because like, did you fail to find an effect because the effect isn't there? Or did you fail to find the effect because you suck at experimenting? And sometimes you just aren't very good at experimenting. You didn't set it up. And not that you're a bad person or you're a bad scientist. It's just that your setup wasn't quite right. There's some hidden variable that you didn't think to account for. There's some little thing that you didn't do quite right. And you know, if you try to run an experiment and don't find an effect, you're faced with this question of like, OK. What does that mean? Uh, so there's this really serious issue uh, about how the, so we're, we're, we've passed the sort of discovery phase. We're on to the kind of uh, confirmation phase of the scientific process. This really serious issue that's kind of plaguing a variety of sciences right now called the file drawer effect, where so replication is supposed to be how you make us claim reliable, right? A given individual scientist might be just cheating for the sake of getting more grant money. They might have cooked their data. Uh, they might not be a good experimenter. But they got a statistically significant result, and it gets into a paper, and it gets published. Uh, now, you're a different group, of scientific group, and you try to replicate their findings. It's a, the basis of the scientific method, right? You found it. If I can find it too, then we've got kind of an intersubjective agreement on this thing. But if you don't find the effect, like you're much less likely to get published because journals don't like failures to replicate. It's not a very interesting thing, right? It's not a very interesting result. Journals like big new effects. They like dramatic effects. They like effects that are large and novel. That's what makes a dramatic story, scientific story. So that's going to get priority. Every journal is offered more studies than it can publish. And they're going to pick the ones that show something new and interesting rather than research group X failed to replicate this effect. And that could, again, that could mean that they are bad at doing science or that the effect doesn't exist. And so the file drawer effect is uh, failures to replicate are put in a file drawer, the drawer is closed, and nobody ever hears about it again. Uh, a big example of this sort of recently is what's called the ego depletion literature. So for decades, there's been this effect that everybody in psychology accepted was a real thing called ego depletion. So if you do something demanding, like you're doing something demanding right now, sitting and listening and not spontaneously getting up and wandering off, like that takes some of your, some of your effort. Uh, the, the claim was that the more effortful activity you engage in, your ability to exert your willpower gets drained. Like you've, got a, a, like you've got a willpower battery that's drained by using it up. And that if you give, an, if you give people another task that requires self-control, they'll do worse at it. And so you just, 
your, your battery gets drained, and then you, you can't exert as much self-control anymore. I think the classic experiment was that they had people sit in a room with a plate of cookies and told them not to eat it. And then they give them another, another problem. And so one group was told to eat the cookies, another group was told not to eat the cookies, and the group that was told to eat the cookies then did better on a second task, right? A task that involved a bunch of executive control, self-control, willpower, all that stuff. Uh, and what they found was, uh, so the original study found that the people who had been given the self-control task did worse at the next task. And that was like the a humongous literature sort of developed from this effect. Uh, but it has recently been, so people have been trying to replicate it and have found that they couldn't. The effect when the people tried to replicate it under really careful conditions uh, did not reappear. So this big important result in psychology and they failed to replicate it over and over again. And the person who failed to replicate it kind of became an advocate for this and went around asking different psych labs like, hey, did you have any failures to replicate of this ego depletion stuff? They go, yeah, we did. I didn't tell anybody about it because I thought I was just a crappy scientist. But yeah, we did. And asking enough people turned out that there was a bunch of people who had failed to replicate this result. Uh, and because of the file drawer effect, nobody knew about it. Right? Only the ones that, only the studies that replicated the result got published. And typically, they wouldn't even replicate the same result because the other thing that gets selected for in publication is novel results. It's very boring to just do an experiment again. And that's not very sexy from the journal's perspective. It's like, ah, they replicated ego depletion. Hooray. You know, that's sure worth using some of our limited space for. Or if somebody does something slightly different, then that's a, you know, that's a novel result, it's more interesting, and it's more likely to get published. Uh, I said I was gonna try to tell you that psychology's, psychology's trying to get their act together, and they are, uh, so good on psychology. There's this, uh, this <laughs> it's gonna sound bad, but try to, try to think of this as an, in a positive way. Uh, so there's this big project called the, Rep the Rep Reproducibility Project, where they took 100, big important studies from three big important psychology journals. Uh, these were not small unknown research groups uh, publishing in obscure journals. These were central uh, findings in the psychology literature, social psychology mainly, I believe. Uh, and they found uh, that, w so they, they, they tried to reproduce these 100, 100 experiments. And they found that, on average, the effect sizes were uh, half of the original published effect sizes, which is worrying. You should be worried about that. If you're in psychology, that you should find that shocking and somewhat horrifying. So 97% uh, of the results had statistically significant results, uh, and 36% of the replications had statistically significant results. So that's, I mean, if you're in psychology, and a lot of psychologists, and this is not limited to psychology either. So uh, medicine is going through a reproducibility crisis. Biology is going through a reproducibility crisis. Chemistry has a little bit of it as well. Um, I don't think particle physics is infected by this. Uh, particle physicists have incredibly high standards for uh, what gets to count as a statistically significant result. Uh, and it's really hard to replicate. Like you can't build your own particle accelerator and just try it out. Uh, there's really there's only one Large Hadron Collider, so any experiment that's coming out of there is the only one you can do. Uh, but so psychology has been going through this crisis for the last couple of years. This crisis of confidence, is saying, well, we've had all these studies that everybody assumed were reliable because they've made it through the peer review process. And now when we go and try to replicate them, we find that a lot of them aren't replicating, or at least they're not replicating easily. And so uh, the ones that got published were ones with big effect sizes, right? You got a really nice dramatic effect. Well, that's great. Publish that right away because that's a really interesting result. Uh, but if somebody else in a different lab 
And they, you know, they tried to do them under the same conditions, but maybe they weren't identical conditions. Uh, maybe the lab that was doing the reproduction wasn't quite as good as the original lab. There's all kinds of reasons why you would see these smaller effect sizes and less significant statistical significance. Uh, but man, this is a this sh this should worry you if you're in anything other than particle physics, basically, uh, because uh, replication is not done to the degree or to the extent that you might think from. You know, if you're like me, you're standing outside the scientific project looking in, uh, you might have the impression that replication is just something that's done as a matter of course, right? That every study that gets published has been replicated a bunch of times, and that that's why it gets to be part of the scientific canon, is because a bunch of different labs replicated under a bunch of different conditions. And it seems like that's not actually the case. It's not the case that all studies get replicated reliably, and when they try to, when they try to sort of do that, the results have been quite surprising. Now, once again, I don't think I'm, I'm being mean to psychology here. Uh, the fact that they did this shows that they're not ignoring the problem, right? Is that they're, they're acutely aware of this as a problem and that the scientific method is being pushed forward by this process. So psychologists have been honest with themselves about this and said, okay, this is a problem. What can we do? Uh, there are a variety of things that you can do. For example, you can pre-register your study. So before you run the study, you can say, okay, I'm doing a study on ego depletion. Uh, and I may or may not find an effect, but I'm going to do the study. And then you have, uh, that's a way of solving the, the file drawer effect, right? So instead of only getting access to information that's uh, the result of a successful study that found an effect, we might begin to get access to the failed replications as well. So that's one way of treating this. Uh, the other way of dealing with it, the sort of they're trying to get going, they're trying to encourage, is to give access, public access to all the data. So typically a journal article does not include the complete data set that the results were based on, right? They include some data, but they don't include the raw data, like they don't include the pre-processed data. And one of the ways that you can keep sort of scientists honest is by making the data available because there's always a variety of statistical techniques that you can apply to any given data set and the different techniques will give you different answers. And of course, every individual scientist is trying to become successful. They're trying to get another grant. They're trying to get another job. They're trying to have their work be recognized by their broader community. And they probably believe that they're onto something, right? They probably believe passionately that they have some piece of the truth. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, they're trying to, their psychology at least has begun the process of trying to keep themselves honest in this context where they know that everybody's advocating for their view. They know that, uh, scientists are operating with passion and with like interest in their process, but nonetheless trying to keep it so that that doesn't. Uh, cause the file drawer effect, that doesn't cause people to uh, get a little enthusiastic in the way that they interpret their results and do things like uh, p-hacking. So one of, the, one of the ways that you can get a study to work out to be statistically significant is to, okay, we're going to start with 100 people. We're going to run this, run this psych study on 100 people. Oh, we didn't get statistical significance. Oh, let's do another 50. No, still not. All right, we'll do another 50. No. Okay, another 50. Ah, there we go. Now it's statistically significant. Now we stop adding subjects, right? So you just stop at the very moment when it passes that statistical significance line. It's one of the ways that you can kind of fudge things to get your study to be significant and therefore to, for you to get personal and professional accolades, money, and a future. Uh, so it's really hard to get people not to want those things, uh, but so this kind of project is one of the ways that we can, despite the fact that we know people are like this and that that's kind of how the process works, we can sift their subjective interests. Uh, so one group of scientists wants this effect to be real. Another group of scientists wants it to be not real because that's their hypothesis. And we're trying to figure out ways to get these two into meaningful con conversation with each other, something like that. Okay, so uh, 
Here's the more sophisticated picture of science that Grinnell wants you to keep in mind. Uh, and he wants you to notice all of the ways in which uh, values are potentially relevant to both sides of this process. The discovery process where you're coming up with questions, you're noticing things, you're deciding when you've done a good experiment and when you haven't. And the credibility process when we're evaluating the results of other people's work. So we're deciding how many studies count as evidence for something, uh, as deciding when something has been properly replicated, deciding when to take something from the journal articles, which are kind of discovery claims, and put them into the textbooks, which are supposed to be the most objective parts of science. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of journey that a fact goes through from the lab to the journal article to the textbook and maybe to like the Bill Nye's show where they just teach you the broader public about how science is. That journey is one where you're making things more and more objective. And, but we can't just pretend that the whole thing is objective. You cannot, you cannot act as though values don't play a role in this whole process or else you're missing some really important parts of how science works. Okay. That's it for today. Uh, please read Grinnell chapter two for Monday. We'll talk about discovery.